short time before we start. Okay, uh, we start uh, with uh, today's seminars. We have again today two excellent speakers with uh, multiple uh, links and collaboration to create. And we start uh, uh, the first uh, presentation with uh, Dan Tofik from the Tofik. Dan, do, do I pronounce it correctly? Tofik. Ah, sorry. Ah, Tofik, okay. From the, from the Weizmann Institute. Uh, Dan uh, has studied uh, uh, biochemistry and uh, biochemistry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And then uh, uh, after graduating, he continued with uh, uh, biotechnology and uh, did his uh, PhD at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, following his uh, PhD work in uh, 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 biotechnology, he went uh, to Cambridge, to Alan Fersh, whom many of you know, and uh, continued to uh, his uh, postdoctor with his uh, postdoctoral work there, uh, working on uh, various aspects. I think it is uh, about uh, protein evolution or uh, various aspects of uh, protein evolution, and uh, 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 so he worked at the first groups at uh, the MRC. Later, he became an independent uh, scientist uh, there until he was recruited by the Weizmann Institute, where now he serves as a professor. Uh, the, the main aspect of uh, Dan's work is, uh, the, is uh, the fact that uh, he takes into account uh, evolution not only as a, let's say, an important uh, uh, aspect of uh, basic research uh, to see how proteins change and modify their properties, but also as a tool of protein engineering. This, I think this view is uh, quite interesting. And I think that uh, this is uh, also what he's going to present us today. So the question, I think, is how proteins evolve. Thanks very much, Mike, and thanks uh, for the invitation to come over. I've actually visited Crete a uh, few times before because we have a very good friend here who I met him in Cambridge, but never on scientific ground. So it's, it's nice to be here and then to do with science as well. Uh, so basically, I mean, I have two are the two obsessions in life. One is mountains, which I will not discuss in this lecture, also because I don't consider myself an expert, just a pure amateur. And the second one are enzymes uh, that have really fascinated me, I think, since my second year as a, an undergraduate student. And this fascination is summarized in this slide, where you basically see the uh, half lives of a series of six chemical reactions that are absolutely crucial for life. And if you look at the spontaneous rates of these reactions, they would correspond to half lives going from one minute, which is pretty fast, to one billion years, which is far too slow for life to be reliable. And what enzymes do is to take this range of 10 orders of magnitude in time scales and compress them to the minute down to the microsecond uh, time scales. And in doing so, they enable life to, 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 to proceed. So basically for me, and for many others, life equals enzymes. To do this, some enzymes have to exhibit 17 orders of magnitude of rate acceleration. So this is a bit hard to comprehend. So just for comparison, if I were to walk here instead of fly, uh, the flight limit is three or four maximum orders of, of uh, rates of acceleration, whereas uh, these enzymes, like the superstars of the enzyme world, would be in Pluto by the time it takes me to get to this door. 
So th this is what enzymes can do. And I decided that I'd like to understand the enzymes better, but to understand them not just by studying existing ones, but also by creating new ones. And along this uh, famous uh, Alva Edison quotation of until man duplicates a blade of, of grass, nature will laugh at his so called scientific knowledge. And since if you look at nature, all these wonderful catalysts were made by, not by engineering, but rather by evolution, or by evolutionary tinkering, by this process of mutations that accumulate at random and natural selection that drives enzymes and other biomolecules to, to perform as well as they do. So the first thing that I've, I've done basically when I came to Cambridge is to try to say, let's perform evolution of enzymes in vitro, in the laboratory, in real time. But unfortunately at the time, there was no technology that would allow you to do this. So together with Adam Griffiths, I, I went on to invent this uh, emulsion technology, which is basically artificial cells in which genes and coding enzyme variants can be embedded and this technology is extremely powerful because basically in the one milliliter of this white stuff that you see here, you can compartmentalize 10 to the 11 different gene variants and perform selection for uh, target enzymatic functions. But it turns out that this technology, although you know, used by several groups for molecular evolution, became like very useful in other technologies like deep sequencing and digital PCR and all sorts of other things, it actually turned out that, at least at the time when applying it, we could not evolve those enzymes that we wanted to evolve. So some people, including Andrew Griffiths, went on to improve the technology, whereas I asked, you know, why? So sometimes you learn more from your failures. It's a mountain in France that I failed to climb. Uh, than from success. And to ask, you know, what, are we missing something? Maybe we don't, evolution is a bit more than just random mutation and selection. So actually my research turned from using this technology only to engineer enzymes to apply in vitro directed evolution to understand enzyme evolution to understand how a given sequence that encodes a given enzyme with a known structure and function changes gradually in sequence by mutations to give you a new structure and a new function. And if you reproduce this process in the lab, you can basically get insights about the intermediates, which we cannot obtain by just looking at the contemporary repertoire of enzymes. And also, most importantly, about the driving force that affect this process of acquisition of new enzymatic functions. So today I thought to give you maybe a bit of an overview that also spans over 3.6 billion years of, of evolution. So I will discuss one example that holds for the mechanisms that underlie evolution in, in the contemporary world where we have a huge repertoire of existing enzymes with all sorts of activities. And then I will take you back 3.6 billion years ago to some studies we were doing on how the first, the very first enzyme or enzymes evolved. Okay, so it'll be a bit bumpy, but I hope that by the end of it you will get a glimpse of what uh, we can, or what we understand now about how enzymes evolve. So, one of the first things that dawned on me on failing to evolve things is the issue of a starting point. That basically in evolution nothing evolves unless it already exists. Because you have to have some kind of a starting point that confers some advantage for this process of mutation and selection to begin. However, if you look at the, like, the classic model of, of enzyme action, this is the Eric Fisher lock and key, whereby there is this uh, single structure with perfect complementarity with the active site of the enzyme and the substrate, this model explains very well how selective and proficient enzymes are, but what it cannot explain is why they evolve so rapidly. 
why enzymes functions have, are turning up in evolution time and again. So there is kind of a dichotomy between the, our understanding of enzyme structure and function that explains high specificity and efficiency and the probability of enzyme. So this is where uh, like new models became useful that argue that besides the native conformation of an enzyme that also confers or mediates the native function and has this perfect complementarity in the active site with the natural substrate, proteins are actually flexible molecules that coexist in equilibrium between many, many different structures that relate in more or less to the native one. I mean, they can relate more or less or, or be quite far actually from the natural structure. And this is an inherent pro property of proteins, this plasticity. And the idea is that some of these conformations that are absolutely coincidental and have no relevance to the physiological action may actually mediate functions that are also promiscuous or completely accidental. And that these accidental conformations and functions provide the starting point for the evolution of new enzymes if and when needed. So we have worked on this hypothesis for the last decade or so, and it's, it's, it's mostly published, but I want to give you like the, the crux of it, is this basic hypothesis that functional promiscuity and structural diversity provide the starting points for new proteins. So how do we prove this? We, we've done many artificial evolution experiments, if you like, but we were always so very keen to get an example from something that we, from an actual adaptation in nature. And then this example came about. So this compound, which is called parathion or paroxone, if you have an oxygen here, is a pesticide. It's actually used to be the most commonly applied pesticide. It was first synthesized in 1947. By the mid-50s, it was applied extensively in the US and also in some sites in Europe. And already about 20 years after its application, people have identified enzymatic activity in soil bacteria that degrade this pesticide. And it turns out that certain soil bacteria have evolved an enzyme whose sole purpose is to break down this compound. It does it with extremely high catalytic efficiency with K-cut over Km of nearly 10 to the 9 molar minus 1 second minus 1. And this enzyme was, is tailored for this substrate. Moreover, there are no natural, no natural metabolites with this chemistry of a phosphotriester. Phosphate esters are very common in nature, but they usually come as, as mono or diphosphoesters, but never as triesters. So the question came about how within something like 20 years, nature managed to evolve an enzyme that is nearly perfect. And this is what we went on to study, and to cut a long story short, what we discovered that this enzyme emerged from a family of enzymes whose activity is completely different and unrelated to this hydrolysis of paroxone. So what these enzymes do is to hydrolyze lactones, belonging to this family of NAC homocerin lactones that serve as quorum sensing molecules in bacteria. What's the connection? I mean, admittedly, both are hydrolytic activities, but the substrates, as you can see here, have different structures. And this enzyme hydrolyzes a CO bond, whereas this one breaks a PO bond. However, what we could show is that there is some kind of a coincidental overlap between the original substrate, the lactone, which is shown here in this blue with the lactone ring, and an artificial substrate, the paroxone, that you see here. And the overlap is particularly perfect in the, in the center, in the heteroatom of the, the carbon of the, the phosphorus of the paroxone, and the oxygen of the bond to be broken. This overlap is completely accidental because this family of the quorum sensing lactonases has emerged over 200 million years ago. 
as much as we can infer from the phylogeny, and this compound appeared 60 years ago. It's just the outcome of the fact that there are certain structures would be mimicked by, by natural ones, and that the demands for catalysis can be translated into a new compound. <coughs> However, this is not the whole story, because actually if you look at this, uh, of this family of enzymes that are lactonases that gave rise to paroxonases, and you saw the crystal structure with the lacton analog in the active side, you can see that this is the, the shape of the pocket. This gray envelope is the shape of the pocket of this enzyme bound to a lacton analog. And this active site will not accommodate paroxone, the, the new substrate, as you see here. To accommodate the new substrate, there is a rearrangement on an active site loop that goes from this light blue color which is the conformation used to bound the original substrate, the lactone, and rearranges, opens up to this gold depicted conformation that then brings about a new conformation of the active site that also accommodates parts on the new substrate. And often these conformational rearrangements can be considerable. I don't want to go over uh, for example, I can give you just one another enzyme we have, which is a calcium dependent enzyme, where we can show that the promiscuous activity is mediated by a jump of the catalytic calcium of 1.6 times. So, this is where the calcium is, is placed for the original activity. However, this enzyme has a promiscuous activity that relies on the calcium in a different location. So this is the trick by which new functions emerge from starting points where a single sequence will give you multiple configurations of the inactive site that in turn can catalyze multiple reactions. And another very interesting feature of these coincidental promiscuous activities that we've discovered is that they are highly evolvable. When I say highly evolvable, it means that by virtue of few mutations, you can get dramatic enhancement of the promiscuous activity, typically by two or three orders of magnitude, without sacrificing the original activity. So these side activities that reside latent, irrelevant, until a new and environmental change kicks in, have this ability to provide you something for nothing, or at least initially, like our politicians always like to convince us, you can gain a lot without losing nothing. Of course, we know that later on this trick doesn't apply, and I will show you. But we've shown now, by now, in over a dozen of cases where mutations kick in to enhance the new activity, this is the log scale. And whereas the decline in the original activity is orders of magnitude lower than the gain in the new activity. And moreover, we could go to this enzyme, to this, this paroxonate, and we could reconstruct some of the genetic changes, the sequence changes that gave rise to this change. And it's actually a deletion in an active site group in conjunction with a single point mutation from this to arginine would basically float the ancestral activities, whereas the modern enzyme is a very good paroxonate with no detectable activity with form sensing lactones. This mutant, which is again just a deletion of the site point mutation, became a form sensing lactonate with fairly high activity. However, as you, you can see here, it only lost 30 fold in the paroxonase activity. And indeed, we could show that the standard model for divergence of new functions in proteins in general and enzymes specifically is going through bifunctional intermediates. So evolution is not a leap, it's not a jump from one place to another. It's a gradual transition where you have, say, one activity. This is the ancestral activity that with a weak promiscuous activity that upon selection pressure to, that gives some advantage Mutations would gradually lead you to a bifunctional enzyme that is both a lactonase and a paroxonase, and specialization for the new activity will only happen in the last stages. And indeed, we can now mimic the whole evolutionary trajectories in the lab. 
involving not just few mutations, but relatively many mutations that would change the activity completely. So this is an example of taking this R oxalate that we discussed and that has weak promiscuous activity as an aryl esterase, breaking again a CO bond, which is six orders of magnitude lower, and taking it through 17 rounds of mutation and selection, mutation and selection, until the, this weak promiscuous activity rises by over four orders of magnitude to give you a new enzyme whose k cation okay value with the new substrate is comparable to the original enzyme with the original substrate. In this way, you can say how you can see how a new activity evolves from beginning to end, and you can get insights because we can solve crystal structures. And today, we have the, the people from my lab that continue this have a crystal structure for each mutation along the trajectory, along the 20 mutations that that underlie this trajectory from the original active site with the original substrate to the new active site with the new substrate. And we can also see how the catalytic machinery was reconfigured in order to deal with the new chemistry. So, and we can follow the entire trajectory from the beginning where, again, you have a gain, large gain in the new activity under selection with mild losses of the original activity. So you get this generalist by functional intermediate that is both an aryl esterase and a paroxonase. And then as the selection pressure continues, like further improvement in the new activity come at the expense of large declines in the original activity, giving you a new enzyme whose specificity is primarily in the new activity as aryl esterase and lost five orders of magnitude of the original activity. So these are the things that we can do in the lab to understand the, the paths, the intermediates, and the driving force that give you new enzymes. And with this knowledge in hand, we can now do much better enzyme engineering. So I would just to, to go very quickly through it, but, but just to tell you that we can do it. Once we understand, once we have the power of understanding how evolution acts, we can actually make new enzymes in the lab. So the, something that has been pursued in my lab is to the engineer enzymes to degrade nerve agents. So these are chemically actually quite similar to pesticides, except they are more nasty to humans. And there is a whole range of them. And what these do is to inhibit acetylcholinesterase and cause death. The problem is that if you want to evolve an enzyme that will detoxify these compounds, it has to compete with the very high second order rate by which these compounds buy acetylcholinesterase because this was, these were actually engineered to be highly potent inhibitors. So the intercepting enzyme has to compete with this process, otherwise it's useless. However, these compounds are xenobiotics. They are artificial. There is no enzyme that has actually evolved to degrade these nerve agents. And there are some enzymes with weak promiscuous activities, but this is the k cat over KM values are five orders of magnitude lower than what you would need to detoxify in vivo. Moreover, by the nerve field, or, you know, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. So the nerve agents come in two chiral isomers, R and S. And actually, the preference of the enzyme is for the R isomer, which is the non-toxic isomer. So you have a serious problem of having to increase catalytic efficiency by five orders of magnitude and reverting completely the stereospecificity. But this algorithm of mutation and selection, if you know how to operate it, it will be very really good. So basically, following several rounds, you can see here the white type acquired like six mutations to a K cut or KM that is now above 10 to the 7, which is needed for in vivo into intoxic detoxification, sorry. And also the stereospecificity was completely reverted. Whereas the white type would prefer the R isomer 1,000 fold over the S, here you have the S isomer <coughs> is, is is taken and you cannot detect even hydrolysis of the R isomer. 
So this, this is what evolution can do, and in a pretty short period of time. And indeed, if this is a done experiments done by the US Army, if you give these enzymes to animals and they are exposed to lethal doses of these nerve agents, they basically survive because the enzyme can hydrolyze the nerve agent before it gets to us in the coordinate uh, So the mechanism that I described so far with relation to enzyme evolution are basically mechanisms that are very applicable to today's world when we have a huge diversity of different enzymes with different structures, different catalytic mechanisms. So if a new challenge appears like this paroxone, there would be out there one enzyme or more that can tackle it via promiscuous activities. And also the transitions that I have described so far may be impressive in terms of, of k cut or KM changes, but they are what we evolutionists call <coughs> micro-transitions. So these enzymes that have changed fundamentally, as I've shown you in, a, in their specificity, are actually have identical folds. So if I compare, if I superpose the wild type and the evolved enzyme, the, arc, the overall fold architecture can be superposed completely. And even the active sites are basically identical. This is a bimetal enzymes with two metals in the active site. And if you superpose the original and the new enzymes, the metals are, and the metal ligating residues are essentially identical. So from an evolutionist point of view, these are micro transitions. Yes, they are crucial to the adaptation of organisms, but they don't explain to us actually how the protein world we know today has evolved and why. Because we categorize enzymes to families and superfamilies. In families, we can still see some relationships. You know, this family is maybe a third cousin of the other family because the structures look similar. The sequences sometimes can be aligned. But actually, if we look at superfamilies, they are isolated galaxies, if you like, in the sequence and structure space. And there is absolutely no connection between them. You cannot, if you look at the structures, or let alone the sequence, you can find no connections between these superfamilies. So basically, we have zero knowledge on how these are related, if at all. And of course, we also don't know for any of these enzyme families how it emerged in the first place. So basically, after exploring enzyme evolution for maybe uh, 15 years now, you come to the conclusion that if you ask me now, how did my enzyme evolve, the enzyme I'm working on, I will do a bit of research and I will come up and say, look, it evolved from enzyme X, whose structure and mechanism are nearly identical. Uh, but then you ask yourself, how did the first enzyme or the first enzymes evolve? So, because this is a question for which we have basically no answers at the moment. And about 12 years ago, we began a very long and tortuous road. And I will just show you some preliminary insights that we have, but I cannot answer this question at the moment. I just just like to make sure you invite me again in five years when I can. Okay, so there we have a lot of tantalizing hints. Of course, I'm not the first one to think about it, unfortunately. Amongst them are that certain architectures or faults, as we call them, seem to be very fundamental and widely spread and are thought to be there in what we call the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. This is basically the first organism from which everything that we see on this planet has diverged. Okay? Amongst these is a fold which is called the Rossmann fold. And under this architecture we see today thousands of enzyme families that belong to many different classes that use different cofactors and do very different chemistries. The most, perhaps, dominant ones are oxyreductases using FAD, NAD, or NADP. They are mostly Rossmann fold. 
methyl transferases that use SSA adenosine methionine, and also many enzymes that use ATP and other nucleoside triphosphates. They all share the same architecture, what we call the, the Rossmann fold. And moreover, 50% of the Rossmann enzymes make use of nucleoside cofactors, suggesting that they emerge from the RNA world, because the current thinking is that uh, life began with nucleic acids and only then switched to these problematic molecules that are called proteins. So when these cofactors that are used by the Rossmann code are all nucleoside, they are all derived from RNA. And the only common denominator between these cofactors is the ribose ring, because the base may vary dramatically and also what's attached to the ribose may vary. So the only common or shared like, part of all these cofactors is the ribose. So for, actually for engineering reasons, that we wanted to change the cofactor specificity, we started to look at how are these cofactors bound by Rossmann enzyme. And Paula Laurino, uh, a postdoc in the lab, has started to come up with these structures and we would see that time and again the ribose is bound by a carboxylate chai side chain of ASPO glue in this bidentate manner where the two oxygens of the carboxylate would bind the two hydroxyl, the two and the three prime hydroxyls of the ribose. And we started to do a systematic analysis of all the Rossmann enzymes that are, have known structures with a ligand that contains the ribose. And lo and behold, we saw that this interaction is a hallmark of the Rossmann fold. So these are basically many different cofactors used by Rossmann enzyme where power align the structures just by the ribose. So you take these different structures and you just tell the software align them by the ribose ring. When you do this, you see that this carboxylate aligns also. And with the carboxylate aligns the second beta strand. The Rossmann is a beta alpha, beta alpha, beta alpha repetition. The second beta strand will always align if you just align by the ribose. And we can see that, conversely, the angle between the ribose and the carboxylate is completely conserved in the Rossmann form. Whereas in other folds, if you have this interaction, it would be very rare, but also the angle will be different. So if you look for this type of interaction in, in enzymes that are not Rossmann, you see it in very low frequency, and also the angle will be non-canonical. So for us, this was a hallmark of common ancestry. This means that this is actually the first solid evidence showing that all Rossmann enzymes, that nowadays you cannot align, if I give you an NAD-dependent dehydrogenase and the sum-dependent methyl transferase, you cannot align them. However, this basically single amino acid motif allows you to assign divergence. It took two years to publish this paper because the evolutionists like to argue and they say, no, you haven't proven it. So I, I took a lot of the evidence, but I think we, well, we managed to publish the paper at least and to show that this is a hallmark of common ancestry. But actually, if you dig deeper and one of the reviewers instead of trying to kill the paper actually gave a useful suggestion he told us, look, it's not that just this, but people have shown before that there is a glycine-rich loop between the first beta strand and the first helix. Okay? And you can now go to these different cosmos and you can characterize them by the glycine-rich loop and by the aspo blue at the, at the tip of the beta tube. And this allows us to basically say we don't know what was the first Rossmann enzyme that appeared on this planet, but what we do know with some certainty is that it contained this motif, which is just two beta strands and one helix that has this beta-1, which is now beta-1, alpha-1, beta-2, 
and it had two functional elements that would bind the core factor, which are the glycine-rich loop here and this aspartic acid at the tip of the second beta star. So basically, by this type of, of archaeology, if you like, we can try to infer what were the most ancient motifs that gave rise to what is now a huge diversity of enzymes that are very different. And we went on, and then others also, actually this was very dominant in the literature, the other very diverse family of fault is called pilup NTPases. These all have the pilup or the Walker A motif that you know from many ATPases. And when we analyzed it, we could see that it has a, basically a motif that is quite similar in having a beta and alpha in the glycine rich loop. So by now, uh, there are some interesting uh, like differences. For example, the, the G rich motif is a mirror image of one another. And also the direction of binding of the nucleotide you can see here is goes the opposite, where this here the it ribose points out to the inside of the protein, here it points out to the outside of the protein. So by now, uh, based on our work and the work of others, we have at least two pre-LUCA cofactor binding ancestors that comprise short motifs of about 25 to 35 amino acids that we think have given rise to the two most dominant enzyme families that use cofactor in the enzyme world as we know it today. Okay? So this is really nice, I think, but you ask yourself, if you go to the model proteins and you cut this peptide, you will get nothing, right? Because this peptide is now embedded in a very elaborate 3D structures, whereas the amino acids here interact with the remaining of the protein, which is now at least 300 amino acids, not 25. So this motif on its own is useless. Because also if I would depict the surface of the pocket and this is this motif, you can see for yourself that this motif on its own cannot confer any function. Because if you remove the rest of the protein, it is worthless. So there is a general question that underlies the evolution of, of proteins in general, the early stages of evolution of proteins, which says, can we get a protein from a short peptide? Because now, if we cut these short peptides from existing proteins, we get an aggregated sequence of 30 amino acids that cannot bind the cofactor and cannot do any enzymatic function. But in fact, we know that this mechanism or mechanisms that will give you a fully functional and globular protein from a short peptide must have been very dominant in the emergence of the first proteins because you would imagine that before translation evolved and so on and this primitive life form making accurately transcribed and translated proteins of 300 amino acids was impossible. But a scenario where 20, 30 amino acid peptides emerge is much more likely. And in fact, I always like to, the first one to propose it was Margaret Dayhoff. I don't know if anyone heard of uh, this audience, but she is the mother of modern bioinformatics. This woman, every time you make an alignment or a tree, you use the day of matrix. And she, in 1966, Margaret Dayhoff had seen the sequence of the first peridoxin. Peridoxin is an iron binding protein. Someone managed to, to sequence the first peridoxin. She saw the sequence and she published this science paper. I would have liked to see anyone publishing in Feb's journal based on one sequence, let alone in science, but these were the good old days. Well, she basically said that the evolution of the paradoxin is, shows relics of primitive amino acid sequence short, primitive amino acid sequences that duplicate. 
So Dehoff basically has come up with this idea that modern proteins have evolved by duplication and fusion of relatively short peptide segments. And then the sequence and the structure has diverged to give these complex structures that we see today. But of course, between a hypothesis and, and the proof, there is some distance. And we were very keen to, to show that there are feasible evolutionary trajectories that lead from short peptides to globular and functional proteins. But this is, of course, not so easy. Um, also because we know many proteins that look like repetitions of the same sequence fused to one another, but they are not globular. There is no packing between the motifs. So this is basically a very simple, like, copy, paste, paste, paste with a flexible linker. But no, what we are looking for is a protein which is globular, which has a common hydrophobic core, that has a non-biochemical function that may evolve from a cell. So after exploring it a bit, we came about this very common fold, which is called beta propeller, that you see now in numerous proteins in signaling and in unity and all other. And it's highly symmetrical, as you see in the structure here. And the unit here is called propeller, which is a four beta strands that make this propeller. And they come from anything from four to 12 blades, these proteins. And they seem to be actually, you know, re maybe emerged by duplication and fusion. So what, what's the basic mechanism, or what's the basic uh, idea how such a thing would happen. The idea is that you recruit a short sequence motif from somewhere, maybe from non-coding DNA or from off-frame translation or in-frame translation of an existing protein. And this peptide can oligomerize spontaneously. This is a crucial step. Because when you say a feasible evolutionary trajectory, it means every intermediate along the trajectory has to be functional and give some advantage. Okay, so the peptide has to oligomerize and then confer some biochemical function. It would then get duplicated and fused. So you would get a tandem, like perfectly symmetrical protein that contains here, it's like five repeats of this original peptide that also has to fold and be functional. And then the sequence would diverge and we would have all sorts of topological rearrangements that are interesting, but we don't have time to go into them to give you a mature propeller that would resemble the propellers that we see today. So the problem is that there are, now in the database, there are about 100,000 non-redundant propeller sequences in there. If you try to find internal sequence identity between the blades, less than 1% exhibit some identity. But 1% of 100,000 is quite a lot. So you can try to look, and indeed we could find a certain genomes evidence for this mechanism in the sense that you can see a propeller, a sequence that encodes a propeller in this genome, but then you can see a sequence that is related to a single motif from the propeller embedded in a completely different protein which is not a propeller. So this suggests that somewhere, sometime in evolution, this segment was stolen, was co-opted, to generate this propeller. And in fact, you can reconstruct it. So we found this protein, which is called tachylectin 2, which is a sugar binding protein that has about 45% identity between the repeats. We can do phylogeny and reconstruct the sequence of the ancestral peptide that is supposed to have given rise to this modern protein if this hypothesis is correct. Turns out that this peptide, which is 47 amino acid long, will oligomerize spontaneously to give you some sugar binding. So what you see as functional yield is a test in crude lysates for the ability to bind glycosaccharides. And these are these ancestral peptides. So you see that they are low. They are 1% of the wild type, but they are functional. Moreover, we could solve the crystal structure. And this is the crystal structure of the 
spontaneously oligomerizing homo pentamer and the wild type, and you see that they are indistinguishable. We could show that you could then uh, fuse this ancestral segment five or even six times and get a functional protein, and this gives you like a significant advantage, like fitness advantage, because you get more binding. And the duplication need not be exact, because gene duplication is a random process. It doesn't know where to start, where to stop, whether to copy five times or six times or seven times, but it seems that this protein tolerates it. Okay, so basically we could reconstruct the whole trajectory going from a short sequence recruited from a non-propeller protein to a mature functional propeller. And interesting what we saw is that, or, you know, again, you can go to the trajectory and try to understand the driving forces and look at the intermediates. And the bottom line of this study that we studied now it's actually that what evolution had to optimize is not the biochemical function, because the oligomerizing segment is, is almost as good as wild type. It's just several fold less than wild type. Nor the stability of the structure itself. Actually, these fully symmetrical proteins cannot be melted down. Their TM is, is above 90 degrees. But actually, the ability to fold was the main parameter that evolution had to, to optimize. Because these fully symmetrical proteins are highly problematic in terms of folding. They are highly prone to misfolding and aggregation because of the high symmetry in the sequence. You can form the correct interaction and a wrong interaction with the same energy. So what evolution had to shape is really the folding. Neither, again, the biochemical function or the, or the final structure. This, but, uh, so uh, this work was actually the first, very first evidence that this mechanism of oligomerization, duplication, and fusion is feasible, that it can lead from relatively short peptides to a mature globular and functional protein. And that the main limiting factor is actually folding. But it also gave us more, if you like, driving force to go back to these ancestral proteins, to these ancestral, predicted ancestral motifs that we discussed before, from the Rossmann and the Pilu, and to try to prove that duplication and fusion of these short motifs can give you a folded and functional protein. And we are, in the last month or two, we have started to see a bit of light at the end of this uh, dark and long tunnel, uh, with a period motif that you can take and infer from proteins that are now have very different structures and cannot be aligned except the Walker A motif. And actually using computational design, this is ironic that in order to prove it, to reconstruct the evolutionary intermediate, you need computational design. But computational design has become really the group of David Baker has designed these repeat proteins that comprise perfect repeats of this beta loop helix motif that was inferred of the ancestor of the P loop. And we think that these proteins, where we can see robust signs for their ability to bind single stranded RNA and maybe have a bit of ATPase activity. So hopefully, the next time we, we meet, I will might be able to show you how from a relatively short peptide that has this crucial cofactor binding motif, the first enzyme may be involved. Okay, so the most important thing is to tell you who did this work, because all I do is, you know, you know go from one nice place to another and give talks. <laughs> But it's actually very dedicated and talented people. Of them, these are people that left the lab, the Nobuto Kariki, Vignata Friat, Mikhail Elias, uh, and that worked on the divergence of enzymatic functions, these principles of promiscuity that I discussed in the beginning. Uh, both Norway, the professor now in UBC, and Mikhail in Minnesota. 
Rob Smoke did the Propeller Reconstruction. Agnes is a wonderful bioinformatician that did all the phylogeny and reconstruction and then protein analysis that I've shown. She's now postdoc in Harvard. And currently in the lab are Paula Laurino and uh, Sissi, Maria Luisa Romero, who are working on trying to um, reconstruct the first P loop and the first Rossmann enzyme by ancestral influence. And thanks very much for your attention. Grammatica, 
appearance of the new motif or something uh, so the sequence structure space that you go to a new galaxy let's say the way yeah. no so you always move within yeah as I said you know even if you do 20 rounds and and thematically we get something which is fundamentally different than the original enzyme when you put the structures, the fold is exactly the same, the heat analytic residues are in place, and it's not just us, everyone else that does it. So uh, there is, in the evolutionary theories, there is a famous one which is called the hopeful monster. This idea that, in general, sequence, I mean, changes in evolution are very gradual and incremental, and it's not a leap from here to there. But there is this idea that occasionally there would be a mutation that can change, say, the structure completely. And indeed, people have now shown the, these uh, metamorphic proteins that are even the same sequence or within one mutation, they would switch, the, uh, the fold will change. But what no one has been able to show so far is that you would actually gain any kind of, you retain any kind of function. As in evolution structure with no function is not particularly useful. So so, in case. Yeah. Most the reason the thing, I mean this is a lot of work we've done, has been to look at the effect of mutation. Eighty percent of the mutations just destroy the protein. Mm -hmm. So you start this is a very, you know, it's a it's a lottery basically. So eighty percent of mutations just destroy and then the, the fold or the function and so on. There are even mutations that will do these small changes we've seen in our area. So then the general thought now is that the likelihood of a single mutation changing the structure and the function completely is very unlikely, but it doesn't mean that it never ever happened in evolution. So it could be that you can cross between these galaxies, it's just we don't know how to do it. When you showed the evolution from a non, uh, from the short sequence of the propeller to the five uh, strand propeller thing, um, you said that the ability to, to fold was the primary drive for filter variants. Have you pinpointed specifically the chemical properties that keep the ability to fold, that provide this, this ability? So, I mean, basically what Rob did is to go to the old intermediate and all the trajectory and analyze them in detail. And what we saw is that the, in, the protein expression levels remain roughly the same. It's just that the early mutants, 99% was aggregated. And then you can also do, it's, uh, I skipped this, but you can check this by refolding. So the early intermediates, if you unfold them, say, in urea, and you try to refold, they refold very poorly, whereas the later intermediates in the trajectory refold with 30 and 50 percent efficiency. The thing is, what we saw is that there are, this whole process is very subjected to trade-offs. For example, in the oligomeric stage, from a folding of the one point of view, the concentration needs to be very low because if you have high concentration, you start to get aggregation through to like non-native interactions between party molecules. But then the assembly of the oligomer requires high concentration. So you're already strained in a very narrow range, yes? And later on, we saw that the final stability trades off with the ability to fold. So these sequences, they were super stable when folded, but they would fold miserably. When folding was improved, this came at the expense of the final. So we basically see that it's not only that folding is the main constraint that evolution has to work through, but it also has to drive, you know, through very narrow alleys to find a way to sort out this problem. Okay, any other question? 